I'm Tom Ray, and this is my art podcast. On this episode of the podcast, I get the chance to meet. My name is Jenny Gao. I am an artist and entrepreneur. I've been running my business full time for the last five years now, and my focus is on large scale projects, including murals, public artworks, and curatorial work. I grew up in Kansas, finished my studies in St. Louis at Washington University, and then from St. Louis moved to Milwaukee. And the last job I had in Milwaukee um, was at a company that offered me a promotion to relocate to their Madison location. So that's what originally brought me to Madison. So from Milwaukee to Madison, what was the job that brought you here? The corporate job that I held was in manufacturing. My last position was as a project manager, leading projects with Lean Six Sigma, continuous improvement. So I was looking at processes, looking for ways to reduce waste and improve the way that we did things at, at the company. And, uh, and so that's like if you may have probably gotten the sense I'm a bit of an efficiency and process geek. Kinda, uh-huh. yeah. yeah, a little bit. Yeah. And uh, before, before my time in manufacturing, I was working in the public school sector. So I was working in Milwaukee Public Schools as an art program specialist um, for, for schools that hadn't had art gym music in seven or more years. And just from my time working in the Milwaukee Public School District and my time working in the manufacturing sector, I saw the adverse effects of not investing in creative autonomy, that the students had creative education opportunities removed at a very formative time in their lives, and that negatively impacted what they were able to achieve and their ability to be critical thinkers and see other possibilities besides the ones that were right in front of them. And for manufacturing as well, you know, this is all post-recession, and so I'm I was working in an environment that had a lot of people, including the leaders who were scared of what the future of our companies and our economy looked like and knew that something needed to change, um, but didn't necessarily see the connection between that and the divestment in the people who make our companies possible over the course of the last few decades. And that was very much tied with the recession that we had. Around what time period was this? So I was working in the school system up through 2011 and then in in Milwaukee. In Milwaukee. So yeah, 2010, 2011, and then manufacturing up through to 2015. So, so this was all uh, in the aftermath of the 2008 recession. What age range were you teaching in the schools? Uh, I was teaching ages K-4 through eighth grade. So, it, and you're saying that they were kind of they were underfunded or? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. You know, I, so the school that I was stationed at had not had art gym or music in seven years. And I was the first art teacher that they'd had in a really long time. And so, you know, I was brought in to rebuild that curriculum and recreate what that program would look like. It was a pilot to prove that this is the impact that it would have. And yeah, and you could definitely see the negative impact that that had around that same time. You know, I was working in, in Milwaukee public schools and Milwaukee is one of the the most segregated city in in the nation, and the schools that were predominantly br- black and brown were the ones that had programming like the arts cut because the arts were seen as a path to poverty. And meanwhile, the arts were maintained at the wealthier suburban schools that were predominantly white because the arts were seen as a path to enlightenment. And so that's where we begin to see that disparity. Why is it that we see art as being enlightenment for one and poverty for the other? You know, so segueing from my time in um, arts education to manufacturing, prior to education, I had worked in uh, the Kemper Art Museum in St. Louis and working as a floor manager there and overseeing the schedule of the people who were the attendants at the museum, overseeing training and best practices for how we handled the artwork and staffed the galleries. So I had a lot of experience with documentation and again, like programming, curriculum building. And I started in manufacturing essentially because of a transfer of skills that I could also implement documentation, best practices in the manufacturing environment. What kind of manufacturing? Commercial printing. And I, as I started in the role, I started to gather pretty quickly that the processes at this company had evolved in, in such a way that a lot of the things that we were trying to standardize and document really didn't need to be done. A lot of it was pretty wasteful. At that time, I didn't know what Lean Six Sigma was, but I just started collecting data on where the breakdowns in the processes were happening, what we needed to change and fix in order to make it feasible. 
to establish best practices for the company. I don't know what Lean Six Sigma is. What is that? So Lean Six Sigma is a, a methodology for improving the work environment. It like The core philosophy is finding ways to reduce and eliminate waste from your processes. Environmentally or even just the process in general? In general. It just, all, yes, all, all of the above. So environmentally, in, in terms of the amount of time, resources that something takes up, and how you transfer that energy to other things. So if we're no longer spending all of this time and using up all of these resources for one thing, we can transfer that to another part of the process. That's kind of it in a nutshell. And the part that I really enjoyed about it, at least the methodology and philosophy by which I was trained in practice was that it was intertwined with training and improvement of the workplace for the people. And that I think is really key because a lot of times I think efficiency has been misused Mm -hmm. in a way that just like, you know, like people are resources and we like strip them out of the process too. And I don't think that's a good way to do things. And unfortunately I worked with people who were in agreement with me, but any of the projects that I led were also paired with a training initiative a training initiative that would be aligned with job mobility, other opportunities, like how do we uh, make sure that anybody who's in this work gets to be the person who reinvents that process, not just to have it reinvented for them. And trusting people as the experts in what they do, that they are capable of changing these things if given the right tools. And then also ensuring that by making these changes, people have access to other opportunities. They can move to another department. They can move up to, to another position. That You're saying the efficiency can actually make them gain more skills. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's just it's, a, it's about helping people see and use change as a way to open up other opportunities. A lot of times when we see fear in the workplace, when we see somebody hoarding knowledge, um, when we see somebody like you know, like we've all seen like institutions that have a lot of like institutional knowledge, and somebody who just like like they have that key, you know, they have yeah. that key, they have that one piece of information that nobody else has, mm-hmm. and then that key gives them that security and that role. And essentially, what I was doing, and as a part of my job, was that hey, if instead of hoarding these things, we shared them and do cross training with other people so more people know these things not only do we all become more resilient but then individuals too can have their time freed up for other things you know when people hold on to a specific task uh, because they think that's going to give them job security it's not because it gives them fulfillment it's because it gives them a sense of security and how do you ensure that people feel like if they let go of the thing that gives them that feeling of security they'll get to pursue the other things that they would actually really enjoy doing. And that requires an environment with a lot of trust. I very much feel that creative autonomy is necessary to our survival and to our fulfillment. Mm -hmm. And seeing the ways in which we did and did not succeed at doing that in, uh, in the school environment, in the manufacturing environment, that's what really pushed me to quit my corporate job five years ago and start my business and try and pursue the arts full time. What were you doing artistically? I mean, you were, you were involved in all these processes and helping other people, but you were clearly doing artwork before that. So what sort of things were you doing during this time? Different things at at different times. You know, I, I did study the fine arts. I sometimes joke that I'm a recovering engineer because I'd enrolled in engineering school before deciding that I wanted to be an art major. Really? Yeah, I did. And, uh, and and fortunately, I didn't go that route because then we wouldn't be having this conversation today. <laughs> and yeah, so I, so I studied the fine arts. I studied printmaking. And I continue to have an active art practice after college. I, I got my first shows out of college pretty quickly. Did you set them up yourself or how did you get the shows? I, I got shows at galleries. Yeah. I, I, do you just walk up to a gallery and go, Hey, I want to do a show here. Or I mean, it's, is it that easy? Naive, when you're young and naive, you do that. Okay. Um, yeah, right. so yeah. So, and that's, and that's what I did. I, you know, when I, when I first got to Milwaukee, I, I reached out and I sent some emails. I'm like, to people like, Hey, like I'm new in the area. I'd, I'd love to meet for coffee. Not necessarily with the expectation of getting a show, but mm-hmm. that I wanted to meet people. And that I think was really valuable. And I think something that a lot of people undervalue the power of that, yeah. you, that you can just reach out to me and say like, Hey, like I'm new in the area. This is what I'm looking for. Would you be willing to 
meet up for coffee. It takes a little bit of guts, though. Like, how did you get over that? I mean, that's also very intimidating. It's one thing to send the email and go, oh, my God, they replied. And then it's like, well, now I got to go meet them. Sure. Yeah. You know, I, I, it was it was long enough ago now. It's just it's something. I love it. You're like, you can't even. I don't know. I think maybe it was. <laughs> it was yeah, I, I do it like, you know, it's just it's just such a normal thing. And I, and right. I think that certainly, yes, like I like I there were a lot of things that I was nervous about when I first started my career. But I think the bigger thing to emphasize is that you don't you don't have to be fearless to do the things that you want to do. And you don't have to necessarily know how how things are going to go without trying. Mm -hmm. And I'm a big believer that showing up is maybe not even just half the battle, but sometimes more than half. That any of the work that you expect to happen after that first requires that you showed up in the first place. Why did you choose printmaking? Out of all the different mediums, you said that you went to school for printmaking. Yeah, I knew that I wanted to be in the arts and I didn't want to study graphic design or communication design, anything that related to software that I felt like I'd have access to at any point mm -hmm. in my life. Um, I wanted to try something while I was on a university campus with facilities that gave me access to things that I wouldn't easily have mm -hmm. outside of a school environment. And that's honestly why I chose printmaking. Um, I, I took a, an intro class to it first to see what I thought of it. And I really fell in love with the medium. I think what I found in printmaking resolved a lot of the dilemmas that I had as a kid about, about what my interests were. It never seemed possible to be both interested in art and technology. And printmaking is both an art form and a technology. But a lot of people said you have to choose between being left-brained and right-brained, be, like being creative and logical. Like you can't... Well, yeah, yeah, you know, I think like now, like more and more people are realizing that that sort of false dichotomy <laughs> wasn't, wasn't the right thing to set up. But, uh, you know, I, I think... Uh, I think even now there are still people who believe in that false dichotomy and people believed it even more than they do today, 20, 30 years ago. Yeah, so like I, I grew up with a lot of adults who pushed that message that, that you cannot be both. That, you know, like God forbid you're born with both halves of your brain, just use one side for the rest of your life. So with print, I think that was when I first realized that these qualities that I had were not opposites but complements that the fact that I'm creative doesn't hurt the fact that I'm also very systematic and analytical printmaking you're making prints on a matrix you have to be good at building systems there's it's a very process heavy art form it's a very democratic art form it was the first social media it was the first time that we were able to share a message with the masses and even today it's it's a way in which people transmit a political message that sense that art could be from and by the community felt really embodied in printmaking and it felt different from what i'd been sold previously that the only way to succeed in art was for art to exist for the elite what kind of art were you doing before printmaking? Drawing, painting. I think that was a time when my, my style was really like starting to come together. I didn't have a good art education in my primary or secondary schooling. Kansas is one of the two states with worse arts funding than Wisconsin. Really? I know, right? Yeah. Huh. Yeah, they're tied with Georgia. So yeah, seven cents per capita. Wisconsin spends a whole 13 cents per capita on the arts. I know. <laughs> like we're, we're like big spenders over here. <laughs> and yeah, so... I did not have access to a lot of art opportunities growing up, and maybe that's part of why I've become so passionate about it mm -hmm. as an adult. Um, I didn't have a lot of encouragement in it, even though a lot of people acknowledged that I was talented in it. I think when I first got to school, the first thing was I just kind of felt overwhelmed by what I perceived as like quite a large gap between where I was and where some of my classmates were. WashU is a very privileged school. I was able to get there on a full scholarship and I felt very fortunate to be there and I was also there with students who had 45 college credits by the time they enrolled because of AP classes because of SAT prep because of all of these extracurriculars that they had at their private schools and their magnet schools that I didn't mm -hmm. have you know I did my school like got its first AP class as I was graduating yeah. from high school so I, I kind of felt like I was out of my depth but 
uh, once once I was in there, I just really threw myself into everything that I felt was necessary to catch up and also feel on par uh, mm-hmm. with the caliber of education that I was receiving there. I fell in love with making really big work. Yeah. And that was something that I wouldn't have known prior to being in college. And uh, just to like finally like actually have the space to, to do that work and to know that that was even an option. And I kind of got obsessed with doing bigger and bigger installations. I wanted the work to become more immersive and to take up more room. And I don't know that I knew why that appealed to me so much. Now, in retrospect, it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> you know, now that I make murals and uh, and public artworks and that, like, you know, like, part of what appeals to me about these public and large-scale works is that they speak to the same philosophy as printmaking in that they're democratic art forms, mm-hmm. that installation-based pieces, by virtue of taking up space, affect uh, and become a part of their environment. Mm-hmm. And especially as a first-generation American growing up in rural Kansas and a predominantly white community and feeling the need to assimilate, I, I think that that was kind of profound that as I came into my artistic voice, it was about taking up physical space. When you say printmaking, you're talking about wood carving. Yeah, I've done a lot of different forms of printmaking. Woodcut is the medium that I've really come to specialize in. So how did you get started doing murals? I know you said you move bigger, but you don't just go, okay, now I'm going to start doing murals. Or maybe you do, I guess. I, how did you start doing that? That's kind of it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I, uh, I, I started doing murals. I, you know, at some point I put together my first proposal to do a mural and. Oh, but there was a proposal. That's, a, that's what I think what I was getting at is you can't just go start painting a wall. Otherwise you're graffiti. I did an art residency that, and that was the first mural that, that I did. And I, I kind of made the commitment and the goal that after I quit, I wanted to do my first mural and. I followed through on that goal. What was the first mural? It's in Milwaukee. Yeah, okay. it's one on migration. So how do you plan something like that and then trans... Because I'm assuming you set it up ahead of time and then you transfer yeah. it. So like, what's the process for something like that? Sure. So that's creating the design ahead of time and then scaling it up. And it's honestly like, I, I hate to oversimplify it. It's honestly not too different from printmaking, you know, that you... Yeah come up with a design and you create a matrix for producing your design. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did for that mural. Do you find that murals come in waves? Because I feel like right now it's kind of, it's, it's got a resurgence again, Uh, or has it always been there and I'm just now noticing it? You know, I've only been in Madison for a little under six years now, so I can't speak to what the mural scene was like before here. Um, Mm -hmm. I know that at least when I came onto the scene, there weren't, there weren't and still aren't that many murals in Madison and a lot of people attributed it to the very taciturn Scandinavian aesthetic that exists here that well that that thing that the design here tends to be clean and safe and you know and pragmatic Mm -hmm. like it kind of like speaks to these more I guess you could say puritanistic values you know what I think is interesting is that like even here you see these faded signs from from decades ago and we know that these were hand painted signs and that not that long ago sign painting was a very prominent profession i don't think that it's an accident that 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 profession went away not just because of digital people like to blame digital for why sign painting became obsolete but what we don't pay attention to is how our laws changed And it's actually illegal in Madison for a business to have more than one sign. Oh, yeah. Your sign has to be, like, only so big. There are Mm -hmm. ordinances in place that prevent you from having signage of a certain size, signage based on the type of business that you are, Mm -hmm. like, what side of your building it can be on. You know, our our sign ordinances are honestly, like, kind of ridiculous. And that's crazy to think that sign painting which has been a long-standing profession, is actually illegal. I know those are strong terms, 
But I don't think enough people put it that way, mm -hmm. that, that a career was killed, not just because technology changed, but because laws changed. What else could be done or how could, how could sign making evolve? I think we've already seen some of that resurgence with the handmade movement, with the makers movement, yeah. with people taking an interest in this. Um, certainly typography did not go away. No. You know, it's, uh, it's just, it's just transfer to another medium and and we have seen that uh, as far as graphic design goes as far as digital goes websites and i'm sure a lot of the people who have those interests like transferred essentially to another industry i do think though that we still have to look closely at how our public sector and our policies shape what industries look like. I know that one of the reasons that it took a long time for the Madison mural scene to start getting some steam is because of the ordinances that exist around signage, that there are murals that have been painted over or were threatened to be painted over because they didn't follow sign ordinances and that we're making it actually extraordinarily difficult for this type of industry to exist. You know, people think of like laws regulating substances that we ingest in terms of like what's legal and what's not legal. And I don't think people necessarily think about it in terms of the design of our public spaces and what those look like. But what do you think of murals as far as just being able to freely make them or people being able to just go, I want to put something on this wall and not get in trouble? I feel really complicated about <laughs> the mural scene in general. You know, obviously I love murals and I, and I love work in public spaces. Murals and public art can easily be weaponized for gentrification under the guise of revitalization. And we see this happening. We've seen it already happen in a lot of places. So you, you have this situation where somewhere along the timeline, you think of like, okay, sign painting got erased as a career in an industry, not just by digital, but by our laws. These laws don't just affect sign painting, but also murals. And essentially, like what, what we're restricting is um, what type of expression we want in public spaces. When we have laws that restrict murals and sign painting, it is about controlling the public aesthetic. You think about how that matches up with suburbia and white flight, and that a lot of suburban neighborhoods have ordinances in place, home association rules in place about what colors people can paint their houses. They can only be these shades of light beige and how that also parallels the way in which street art has been criminalized. Mm -hmm. And then you think about how all of this comes to today when suddenly murals, street art, public art are becoming popular and monetized and not always monetized by the people who created them. It's pretty messed up when you realize how all those pieces come together. So I feel really complicated about this, this surge of popularity for murals. On the one hand, you know, I think like a, a younger me would be really excited that finally like murals are becoming popular and, and people want them. And at the same time now, it's like, well, the reason that people want them is because cities and businesses realize that, that they add value, that mural alleys bring foot traffic to an area, that tourists come to, to check out the murals in a city. Like, it's happened multiple times in, in like, across the nation where a mural alley has gone up and become a tourist destination and as a result displaced the homeless people mm -hmm. who may have been using that alley. And okay, sure, maybe we don't want homeless people to have to live in an alley, but the solution isn't to just keep displacing them. And, you know, you pair this with the fact that we live in a society that tells artists that they have to be starving and that they have to be poor, essentially sets up artists to be easy marks for their work to be taken advantage of. Now you've got people who are like, here's a really great like mural opportunity, here's a chance for exposure, and you've got young emerging artists who are excited to just get into the field, and they're willing to do it for cheap, a lot of times less than it costs to paint the wall one color, mm -hmm. which is insane when you think about it, yeah. you know? They're not even making enough money to stay in the city that they help to gentrify. And there's not nearly enough conversation on how we address that. More of the show after this break. Thank you. 
I feel all these years I've been misinterpreting the the phrase starving artist. I think that the phrase means that you have to find different means to support yourself if this is what your path is going to be. Not like, oh, if you're an artist, you're going to be poor until you get discovered. I think it's what it is, is you have to find a non-traditional way to support yourself. Otherwise, you will starve. And that's just my interpretation. I've always thought that that was a destructive phrase to begin with anyway, starving artist. Well, and so what you just got right there, like it, it is romanticized. This yeah. It's fabricated. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people don't know that the origin of the starving artist image that we know today traces to the 1800s into a play called La Bohème or The Bohemian oh, yeah. that romanticized the idea of the artist who rejects society, rejects greed, rejects capitalism and goes and lives in a commune and celebrates being poor and outside of the system. And what that story left out was that there are basically two ends for living that life. You die mm -hmm. or you were already rich to begin with and you wore poverty as a brand mm -hmm. before re-entering the system and becoming wealthy or being like continuing being wealthy, mm -hmm. which is like, like that's the story of Picasso, mm -hmm. right? Like he went and he lived the bohemian lifestyle for a bit and then he went back to the institution because he was already privileged to be in with. And so we see that like happening over and over again. And, we, and we've seen this story, you know, La Bohème was a very popular and successful story and we see it getting reinterpreted over and over which is ironic in itself though too because it's a story about that yeah because he sold or whoever wrote that sold the play about that storyline who it possibly could have been about somebody else and he took it and ran with it yeah, yeah absolutely i don't think that we should look past the fact that the starving artist stereotype exists in the same world as the artist for the elite mm -hmm. stereotype and, you know, how can it be both? You know, people always like talk about like, oh, well, you'll be famous when you're dead. I mean, that's literally written into our tax laws. Mm -hmm. Your artwork becomes an estate after you die, mm -hmm. but that you yourself cannot reap those benefits of it while you're alive. I just thought of this. What do you think of copyright and the extension of it because of like the, the Sonny Bono law and all that kind of stuff, like it being still copyrighted or owned to 70 years after you've already died? I'm a fan of protecting people's rights. Okay. I mean, I know there are some folks who just want things to be open and, you know, creative commons, which I certainly understand, but I I believe in protecting people's rights and I and I think that implemented correctly, that's what copyright should do. I know that some of the feelings that people have when it comes to that is, you know, like are we restricting information? And you could look at that look at it that way, but you could also look at it as how do we protect the ideas and the identities of people who would otherwise not have it? Mm -hmm. You know, especially you get into topics like cultural appropriation, issues with businesses, organizations that have a much larger platform exploiting the work of an individual artist, businesses that require artists to sign away their copyright and then proceed to continue merchandising the work. I think that this is a, fundamentally uh, a question of how do we use laws to protect individual rights? I've always wondered is just like technically that's a copyrighted work, but it's on a building. Somebody paid to have it there, but everybody gets to enjoy it. And I think it can be multiple things. You know, we don't want to set up like false dichotomies that, that if it exists in a public space, it must be entirely public in the, in the public domain. Mm -hmm. As far as uh, something being in a public space, you know, we've seen cases where large corporations have shot commercials in front of murals mm -hmm. and uh, had fashion shoots in front of murals yeah. and monetized this work without crediting the person who created it. When did you decide to then start going into business for yourself? So you've had all these opportunities, you had all these places you worked at. Then five years ago, you said uh, you decided to start your own studio. So how does that come about? I'd known for a while that starting my own business was something that I wanted to do. And it was mainly a matter of getting to a place where I could. I knew that I wanted to start a business. I knew that I wanted to prove that it was possible, maybe not necessarily easy, to build a business in the arts, but that it was possible. When I graduated, that like that wasn't the right time to do it. It was into the recession. My father had actually passed away uh, the year that the recession had hit. And so I was helping my mom with paying off his medical bills and figuring out where we were in the aftermath. For many reasons, it just wasn't the right time to launch into my own business. I knew that it was something that I wanted to do 
someday. There wasn't necessarily a moment when I knew that it was going to happen. I know that for a while I'd just been saving up, getting back to where I felt I was situationally stable and then also able to build savings towards the goal of launching a business. I actually had a thousand square foot storefront studio in Milwaukee. And so that was my original plan was that um, you know, when I took the day job at the manufacturing company, that when I was ready, I would quit that job. And then that studio is where I was going to run my business. So you had it while you were working there? I did. You know, it was pretty arduous to be running both, uh, doing both the day job and then at night running this studio. And that in and of itself wasn't what resulted in plans changing. I just realized that that wasn't at all sustainable. While I was taking some time just to like regroup, regroup my thinking, because um, I just felt like I was busy all the time and I didn't actually, I couldn't actually see how one thing added up to another because I couldn't give myself that time and space. While taking that time and space, I realized that I was really good at my job. And I ended up working on bigger and more ambitious projects in, in manufacturing. I was working on projects that resulted in $500,000 worth of savings by cutting the amount of material waste mm -hmm. on some of our processes. Uh, and the people that I worked with who held the same job title as me, who all had finance and engineering degrees, didn't understand essentially how I was outperforming the department. And I fully credit that to my art degree. I fully credit that to the fact that uh, I am somebody who thinks differently and who is process-driven. Art is about process. Manufacturing is just process on a bigger scale. Mm -hmm. Especially as an artist, we know how to reinvent process mm -hmm. and not just follow the textbook on how to do it. So that skill set was a big part of what made me really unique in the corporate environment. And with that said, you know, I also gained a lot of business skills from working in manufacturing that I wouldn't have had otherwise when I launched my business. I launched this when I was still in Milwaukee. I, I don't think that it would have been successful or as successful. And so it just happened that, you know, the company I worked for offered me the promotion to relocate here. And I took that move and I closed the studio there. And for a bit, I thought maybe that that was the right track to go. I don't think there was necessarily one moment when I knew it was time to leave. I think there were lots of little moments thinking about whether the team that I was working with was the team that I wanted to work with in the long term, thinking about big picture wise, did this make sense? You know, I, on, on a fundamental level, I agreed with reducing waste and reattributing resources and time and energy towards people and, and making their careers better. But I also just sense that like on a, on a bigger level, our corporations don't necessarily know what they're doing all this shuffling around for. And there's still not a big enough conversation in our manufacturing sector about how we're doing things that are better for the environment, how we're doing things that are better for the community. Things are still very much geared towards, well, how do we reduce our waste and then reallocate our resources so that we can just keep growing and growing and growing. It's that capitalist myth that things can grow eternally and they can't. Mm -hmm. So those were some of the things. And then I actually, you know, I was talking with one of my bosses who's on the executive team there about just some of the frustrations that we had with one of the projects that was stalling at the company. And in that conversation, I kind of like made this like sideways comment of like, you know, sometimes I think that people here should just quit their jobs, start a business, and learn what it actually takes to run a business end-to-end -end so that they can see that instead of just what's in their silo of work yeah. to understand how the whole thing fits together. And he said, oh, that's what I did. And I was like, what? You know, and he, and he shared this story about how, yeah, like he at one point like quit a very comfortable and successful job to start his own company and that it, things had been going well and that the main reason that he ended up selling the company was because it wasn't at a stable enough place where he had appropriate work-life balance for himself and his wife and three children. And he said that had he started that company at a different time in his life when other people were not dependent on him, that he would still be doing it. And I said, oh, like, re like really? And he said, hell yes. And then, of course, he, like, did this, like, <laughs> you know, he did this, like, backpedal. He's like, but, you know, there are a lot of benefits <laughs> to, you know, working <laughs> at a company that's already set up and all this, you know, so he, he said. realized he just gave you an out. <laughs> he did. He totally did. Oh, my God. Yeah. And, you know, like, I mean, yeah. So it's a good mentor moment. But, and I heard this and I'm like, 
oh my God, like, I'm going to regret it if I don't do this. And that by itself wasn't, it was all these other things that got leading up to them, like, oh, like, is this really what I want? Is this really what I want? And then I heard that, and I'm like, I have to try this, and I can't really wait any longer. And I had enough saved up to say to myself that, like, yeah, for the next two years, I'm going to give this a shot. I will give myself two years before I have to go back into the job searching market. Mm. And two years in was when I turned my first profit. My business has been growing ever since. What are some of the things you got to do because of doing that? If you hadn't started this, you wouldn't have had that ability. I mean, I, certainly I'm, I'm proud of individual projects. I'm proud of the murals that I've done, the, the bodies of work that I've created, um, the places that I've gotten to travel for my work. I've gotten to do art residencies in Argentina and Chile. And yeah, just like the talks that I've been able to give, you know, getting to give a TEDx talk. I mean, like that's, that's something really cool, you know? Nice. Yeah. So just like some of these things that, that just wouldn't have been possible if I were working an eight to five job. I think just on a more collectivist and ecosystem building level, I, I care so much about the impact of each of these things on the greater ecosystem that we operate in. And it's not enough just to do one cool mural. If my only goal were to do another cool mural, regardless of what the conditions of it were, then I would just do murals and make whatever accommodations to make those murals possible. But that's not what I do. I, I set some pretty tough standards for myself as an artist and, and for the field collectively, for how artists deserve to be treated, for not just being paid, um, not paid just a token honorarium, not paid just a living wage that gets you paycheck to paycheck, but paid well enough that you can have a, a good life. And there are people I say this to who think that sounds radical. I'm like, I think artists should be paid enough that they can buy houses. And, mm -hmm. and they're like, oh my God. I'm like, why is that radical? Doesn't that sound like the American dream of like the 1950s? You know, like it's like, that's not a new idea. And like, yeah, like I think that labor should be fairly paid. I think that people should be able to have an economic floor beneath them and to be able to build wealth for themselves and to be able to tie my artwork into that greater narrative, I think has been the thing that I'm most proud of to work with nonprofit organizations in this town to set those standards, to not take projects at a loss because oh well but the community wants them it's like well the community can have them but that doesn't mean that that it doesn't need to be paid for i think madison right. especially with its you know the most nonprofits per capita and this like this uh, grassroots community spirit which is so great in many ways can also work against itself it can work mm -hmm. against any of these efforts getting big it can work against them being ambitious it can work against paying people fairly because people think that oh like volunteerism is the way but volunteerism is a privilege mm -hmm. you can't volunteer your time if you're worried about how you're paying your bills and that i've been in some pretty hard conversations but valuable conversations with people in this city about how that needs to change. And that's something that makes the work really fulfilling and substantial. I'd like to invite people to pay a lot of attention to how our city is changing and, and for whom it changes for. I think it's really exciting to see the development that's happening in this area. I also think that we need to make sure that we do it responsibly. I want to see a Madison where there's space prioritized as much for art studios as space is prioritized for bars and restaurants and high rises. Mm. I, I want to see a world where every artist I know without question is getting paid for the work that they do that I don't even have to ask. I'm not willing to wait until I'm old to be able to know that. <laughs> I'm a little impatient here. I want to see a world where the next generation of artists is prepared with these tools by their schooling to be not just good workers and employees, but also very entrepreneurial. I think that that's a very vital skill set in today's world, regardless of what path people take. I want to see a lot more diversity, especially as this city changes. You know, like in, in most cities, Gentrification pushes out 70% of people of color mm -hmm. that were previously living there. That cannot, should not happen here. 
And, uh, and especially with the arts, women make up 11% of U.S. arts representation in our museums and galleries. People of color also make up about 11%. When you dig into those statistics, it gets even bleaker, where less than half of 1% of U.S. arts representation is made up of women of color, even though women of color are 18% of the population collectively. That's pretty bad, you yeah. know? And uh, have you heard of the Guerrilla Girls? So the Guerrilla Girls, um, you should look up their work, but the Guerrilla Girls did a lot of work um, in the 80s and the 90s. Actually, I, shouldn't, I'm, I shouldn't talk about them historically. They're still very, very active today. Right. Um, but so the Guerrilla Girls did this piece in the 80s specifically that I want to reference called Do Women Have to Be Naked to Be in the Met? And they cited this statistic that over 80% of the nudes in the Metropolitan Art Museum were of women, but less than 3% of the artists in the Met were women. I, I share that statistic today because here in 2019, white women have gone up to 11% representation, and women of color are still not even at the 3% mark that white women were at in 1989. And that's pretty bad. Yeah. So that's something that I, I really think needs to be put at the forefront, that we can't just expect that to change on its own, that any of these businesses in this area that are thinking of hiring artists to do murals and like on their buildings, thinking of hiring artists to do graphic design work, to do signs or renting artwork from the people here, to be really conscientious about who they're hiring and how that impacts the statistic especially as the city gentrifies. To learn more about Jenny and her studio, you can visit jenny.org, J-E-N-I-E.org. If you haven't already, you can subscribe to this podcast at tomreyswebsite.com. The music for this episode is by my band, Lorenzo's Music, at lorenzosmusic.com. I'll be back next week with another episode, so until then, so long. Mm -hmm.